Hey everybody, Mark Vogt with Voland Outdoors. Today's a fishing video. I'm underneath the Sullivan Road Bridge on the south side of North Aurora, north side of, of Aurora, Illinois. The Fox River is running right in here. And I discovered yesterday, it's ankle deep water and it's absolutely loaded with carp yesterday. Like everywhere. You're gonna see them all around inside here. In other words, this is the perfect laboratory to try to find out how to make carp bite on a fly. Because contrary to popular belief, there is not a single carp in all of the Fox River, which is wonderful fishing. It, it looks like this, see this gravel that's all right here? See this broken rock? That's what the whole bottom of this river looks like. No weeds, no, no muck, no icky scary stuff that you're afraid to walk in there in flippers. Like that? No, fearless. There's crayfish. Crayfish galore, they'll, shit, they'll shoot underneath your flip flops and you'll scream, but you'll get over it. So what we're trying to find out today is, underneath here, all around here, there's probably 60 carp total right in this area within a cast. And yesterday I caught a couple on just a regular mm, olive woolly bugger that looked like a crayfish. Lucky me. Carp, carp feed by taste. You're, you're not gonna tie, it doesn't matter what kind of fly you tie, you're not gonna catch their eye because they don't use their eyes when they're feeding. They stick that little Hoover vacuum cleaner down on the ground and they go and they use their nose upstream to decide if they're going to go upstream to the to that side or upstream to this side they're tasting the water so you got to put something in there that they want to taste but it's also got to cast like a fly so i brought a couple of my backups everybody tells me corn works so i got some fresh field corn fresh actually sweet corn and we're going to tear off a couple of kernels and we're going to try casting a couple of starchy fresh kernels not in a can right off the cob and see if we if they like it we're gonna see if it can cast we're gonna see if it'll sink down in this water I want you to see what this looks like this is what we're gonna be casting into it is literally ankle deep water loaded with crayfish and it's a little bit oh you can actually see them watch their tails out there their little fins are actually moving around right outside there. So you're gonna see, they're still here. I'm gonna cast upstream, camera left. We're gonna drift down, we're gonna try to drop three different things here, four different things. We're gonna drop my black fly, which they're, if, if it's like yesterday, they're not gonna give a shit about. Then we're gonna drop corn, then we're gonna drop bacon rind, one of my favorites of all time, because bacon rind continues to stink, 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 stink. And once it's on your hook, man, there's no taking it off. You gotta love that about bacon rind. It's super good. Look at look at all the waves around here. Waves right there. There was a wave right there. The closer I get, the more we're gonna see just how many there are. There's like one every square meter here. Uh-huh. See that right there? That's not a little minnow. What's going on over here? See all the movement here? That's not rocks. Rocks don't make circular waves coming out. There's all kinds of carp over there. So we're gonna throw bacon rind, we're gonna throw corn. What else have I got? Oh, I'm gonna try ginger, fresh ginger. I figure it stinks too and it's really strong. So I'm gonna try putting ginger on actually first. I think it's heavy and it's gonna sink. But we're gonna throw right in here because this is where all the activity is. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a ball I've got some teeny little red octopus hooks. I'm going to make a chunk of ginger. It's a root. That's why I'm interested in it. I think it'll stay on cast after cast after cast. And it'll continue to eject a flavor into the water. Cast after cast after cast. So I'm hoping they're going to like it. Wouldn't that be cool if it turns out they love ginger? Fresh ginger root. And that it stays on the rod and you can cast. Or stays on the hook and you can cast it. Um... But it also, I think it'll sink. I'm gonna make a piece about the size of an M&M or a peanut M&M, we're gonna hook it on. Let's do that first. 
All right, there's my little red octopus hook. Now I gotta put something on there that still exposes the hook so I can catch it. Small enough that they wanna put it in their mouth, but large enough that it'll help the hook sink down to the bottom. Let's go look and see what I'm gonna do. If I look inside my little bag here, I've got a piece of ginger root. What I'm gonna do is shave it back enough that I can cut a little piece off, cut a little piece off, put it on the hook. Be right back. All right, there's my ginger peeled back a little bit. Try to get the juicy stuff because you want that juice to start expelling into the water to outgas, so to speak. And there's the piece about the size of a peanut M&M. Let's put it on the hook. Okay, guys, here's what I got. Just a little piece of ginger. And I'm not trying to make it round or anything. There's no point. What I'm trying to do is try to make as much surface area as possible so all that ginger juice gets into the water. And if you look at, if you turned it into a circle, a sphere, if you carve this down into a sphere, you've actually created the minimum surface area, not the maximum surface area. You want all kinds of flat sides there so the water rushes over it and sucks some of that juice out and into the water. Here we go. Okay, experiment number one didn't work out so well. Uh, the piece, of, I, I hooked rocks really, really quick, and as I pulled off the rocks, the ginger came off right away. So next, next we're just gonna try loading up a couple of pieces of fresh corn on that exact same little octopus hook. See if we can dangle it down right in between them. I'm certainly not scaring them off. They're literally right there in the water. I wish I had my tripod to, to film this at the same time. Maybe I'll try to go back to the Jeep and get it. But let's see if it works first. Hey everyone out here. I've been out here for 30 minutes. Not a single bite. And there are plenty of carp out here. I've tried floating it in front of them. I've tried sinking it on the bottom. Nothing. The, the truth is... Carp are not predators, so they're not chasing food. I don't, I don't know. I watch these other videos, guys sight fishing for carp out in Missouri or Wyoming and stuff, and they they put something down and they see the carp go after it. I have never in my life in the Fox River seen a carp do that. Never. They just sit there in their little spot of the river and wait for food to come down to them. And if you don't just literally drop it in their mouth, you know, like those fake trout and salmon that are running in the rivers in Chicago, even steelhead, they don't really bite. They don't really. You gotta practically drop the hook in their mouth and then hook them. Everybody tries to lie about it, not me. That's what it feels like all the time. The number of times you actually genuinely hook instead of like drop it in their mouth, those are pretty rare times, let me tell you. But right now, I'm casting out there about 50 feet and nothing so it's a perfect day I'm gonna give up I'm gonna keep fishing but I'm gonna go put on one of my black sexy beasts or my olive sexy beasts. I'm gonna go after a river smallmouth so I'll be right back at least we learned we learned so far corn doesn't work bacon rind doesn't work that's a rock bacon rind doesn't work ginger doesn't work they all cast easy enough, but I'm, I don't see the carp chasing them. Ah, ah. But bass, bass will chase stuff. I want something that's going to chase things. Be right back. So three casts later, I get this lovely monster. And I ask myself, why am I fishing for carp when the Fox River is filled? Look at this gorgeous bronze back. Look at the stripes on that guy. Look at the hate in that guy's eye. He's actually sizing me up. He's not thinking I'm pulling him out of the river. He's thinking he's pulling me in. He's pulling me down into the depths. Gonna make a meal out of me. I just got lucky this time. Look at that. He's a good 16, 16 inches. I'll round up to 20. This is Mark Vogt with Voltland Outdoors. <laughs> Feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel. We'll see you out there. Cut! Bye 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 bye. Five casts later.
the next one. And yes, I kept my rod tip down, pulled him in right up to my knees, left him in the water, put my thumb in his mouth, and is there a chance that you're gonna lose him when you do that? Yes. Will you have a better chance of keeping him if you put a net in there? Sure. But is that the point, guys? I mean, do, do all of the odds have to be in your favor? How about minimalists? How about giving them the chance? How about crimping the hook? How about taking it easy on him when you're pulling him in sideways slowly, take your time even though he might get off? Pull him in slowly, put your thumb in there gently, lift him barely out of the water. And then they got a lot of energy and they want to get back in. Think about it. You know I keep bragging about the Fox River, but guys look, I'm in calf deep water. The whole river is like this. It's 200 yards across. I can walk all the way over there. The bottom looks like this. Do you see what it, do you see what's in here? Are you really looking? That's the first weed I saw on the whole river. And it's just a piece of grass. Otherwise it's gravel on the bottom. Gravel and rock, gravel and rock, gravel and rock. Shin deep, the whole river is like this. And I'm the only guy here for half a mile upstream, half a mile downstream. There's nobody here. I would like the company. There, there's, there's probably 200 bass just in this little area here. And I've only caught the first two. One of them 17 plus inches, the other one, I don't know, 10. But he fought like a warrior poet. What a gorgeous river on an August weekend. Oh, look at that. Did you see that kingfisher come down? He came in and whacked something and then went right back up. He got bald eagles in the river and that's Sullivan Road. Look it up, guys. Look up Sullivan Road. I'm just on the north side of Aurora, Illinois. 250,000 people and it's only one mile that way. Hell, it's not even a mile. It's a half a mile that way. What, a, what an amazing fishery this is. River smallmouth all day, every day from May until September. There isn't a single fishing season like that. Not in the United States. Let's see if I can catch one while you guys are just with me. Normally you gotta strip a little bit. Uh, oh, maybe not. All right, let's try again. We're gonna do a single-handed circle spay cast. There, let it sink down to the bottom. Normally with the, anything that looks like a crayfish, you wanna hit the bottom and strip, 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 so that it makes a motion. You know, it's pushing water, pushing water, pushing water in a way that they sense. They say, oh, hey, see that pulse, 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 pulse? Must be a crayfish, think I'll go get it. Whether you guys realize this or not, the whole side of the bass is a great big listening device. It's a great big eardrum, the side of their body, the whole side. So they're swimming in the stream. They're swimming and pointing upstream, but they're really listening on the left side, on the, on the right side, on the left side. They're feeling for vibrations and they feel that little pulse, boop, boop, boop. They don't feel a drift. A drift signifies a dead animal. They're far less interested in a dead animal, guys. They're interested in things that are alive. What does alive mean? Motion. And you simulate the motion of a crayfish, strip, strip, strip. That puts a little pulse, a little wave through the water that they pick up on. And they move off to the side and they chase it down and then they absolutely snatch it. So let's go get a couple more. All right, I just caught number three. And there's a couple things I wanted to share you guys with you guys. One, I lost him right over there. Now, if he was a trout, I'd have to go some different part of the stream, but it's a bass, guys. Remember, he thinks he's hunting me, and he thinks I got away. He doesn't think he got away. He's the apex predator here. He thinks that I got away. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna cast that same fly back in the exact same place. And what happened? He bit. I brought him all the way into my hand. I brought him all the way up to here. This is where he was in the water. And he was flopping around, and I took the chance, and he jumped off right there. I gave him enough leverage, he jumped off my hook and he left. So I don't even get a picture. So what? So what? I got him all the way up to here. I got my hand on him. He knows I won. I don't have to actually pull him in and stare at him and take a picture to know I got the best of him and he knows it too. 
So he's going to be out there hunting me. But what I wanted you guys to see was this. Bass, bass are cocky. They will take another shot at it. They're not going to run scared. They're not going to turn tail, tuck tail, I guess, and start running off. They think they lost you. They want another shot at you. It's just like you would cast at the, at the bass again. He wants another shot at you because he thinks he's hunting you. So I cast back and I got him. I might still get him again. He might have gotten away and still think he hasn't gotten the best of me yet. And he wants, he wants payback. So I cast right back there again. But what I also wanted to show you guys was this. In case you're wondering how you cast, the river's going downstream that way. That way is directly cross stream. That is exactly where I want to go. Like one rod length up from straight across. Let it sink, sink, sink down and then start stripping it in. You want to be stripping across the stream because that's what crayfish do. Crayfish hardly ever, if you look at them guys, I don't know why, but they hardly ever actually go upstream. They hardly ever go downstream. Whatever reason, they go cross stream. I think it's the fastest way to get to the depths that they sense that. They sense if they go downstream, the river's not gonna get any deeper for them. If they go upstream, the river doesn't get any deeper for them. So when they're panicking and they're escaping, they're actually moving across the stream, which means if they're in the stream and they're moving, they're moving crossways. So if you strip, 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 hold it, let it float down a little bit, go to a different neighborhood, so to speak, strip, 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 strip. If you're stripping sideways, you're simulating a real crayfish on the bottom of this river, down in all of this water. He's going sideways. He's going, he's going, chup, chup, chup. and then he's waiting to see if anything's coming after him. Remember, there's downstream, and he goes, chup, 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 and then he waits. They never expend all their energy. There's no mad rush to shore or out to the middle of the river. Da, 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 da. They don't do that. They go, chuck, chuck, chuck. And then they're under a rock, hiding, waiting, looking around. Anybody got me? And then they do it again. Quit, quit, quit. Did you see three? So do that. Do your three strips, cross stream. Make sure you feel it banging around on the bottom. Doink, doink, doink. If you get hooked up on the rocks, you're in the right direction. If you get hung up, pull, straighten the hook out, bring it back in, curve the hook, throw it back out. You're doing the right thing. Can you guys see that? Can you see how clear the water is here? Knee deep, calf deep, rocks galore. So there's bass out here hunting, crayfish all over the place. I've had five hookups so far, three into my hand. Let's go after number four. Just caught another one. Cast out here against the shoreline. You can see the water's only calf deep there. Strip, strip, strip in, bam. He started to fight, he jumped three times. Came all the way down here as I was getting ready to put my hand in to get him. He literally shot between my legs, came fighting back. <laughs> and eventually I reached down to grab the hook and he jumped off. So I lost him. Which one sounds like a better story? The one I just told you or I hooked him, caught him. Boring. I'd rather play the fish, have some fun, roll the dice, let him take a chance that he's going to best me. In this case, he did. And I might just catch him again in a few minutes. Because I don't think he's done with me. Kayakers coming from up uh, in the Batavia area. The only reason I'm not fishing this way a lot is my nose is red. I'm already sunburned and I'm facing into a hot, it's like 96 degrees here in North Aurora today on August 6th. It's just hot. I'd rather have my back to the sun. No other reason. But otherwise the whole river, the fish could be anywhere. And the big dogs, the big bronze backs look like they're in the middle of the river right out here. So I'm moving in a little bit so I can cast towards shore, get a little one, and then cast out towards the middle, not past the middle, but actually in the middle where I think the big dogs are. Strategy. Okay, so I tied this particular hook and, I, I, and it's been working well for me for days I've been fishing this one, uh, but I probably hooked it about 20 times on rocks, pulled until the hook straightened, and then Reel, it pops off the rock, you reel it in, you bend the hook back with your forceps, and then you keep fishing. That's the right way to do it. Don't lose your leader, don't lose, the, eventually you wear the hook out. But you see that I still got the brass head on it? The hook's busted now. So what do I do? 
Do I throw it away? Hell no. You got a brass thing on? You got a piece of brass? You got a brass head? You got some body? You got some some crystal flash still there? You tuck it in your bag and the next time you're tying flies later on, I've got like six or seven of these collected, I'm gonna clip that brass head off and reuse it. Why, why throw it away? Just something else to think about. He is 12 going on 13 inches, inches. But what was really interesting was I caught him out there about one third of the way across the stream, one quarter of the way. I cast upstream, you see the little tail, these little shoals here. A lot of times just downstream right in this area is where they're gonna be actively hunting because that little extra bit of oxygen makes the water a bit nicer. They just like it there. This guy hit so hard and remember me tell you, tip the rod and keep the rod flat almost on the water. One side effect, one positive benefit I never told you guys about is when they do decide to jump, they jump straight out of the water and you've given, you're not pulling on them so that you're not, uh, you're not impeding their jump. This guy, this guy jumped a full 18 inches out of the water, straight up, boom, like that and out. It was a legendary jump. Look at him, gorgeous fat, you see that belly? That belly's got crayfish in it. Look how fat it is. He's been chewing on crayfish and this was just another one until the vote got him. Ha, so keep that in mind. Rod tip down, pull sideways. Even if you're in the water and you can't beach him, you're gonna bring him up to your hand that way. You may lose him, but you may also get to see some of the best jumps you've ever seen. To see a little fish this start. I mean, that's, he jumped a full body length and a half out of the water and he was only in six inches of water to begin with. What an extraordinary jump, and it was all because of the way I, I played him. Ha! It's okay to scream when you lose a fish. I just hooked one up out there, and he fought me out there, fought. And I don't think I had a great hold on him, because he shook it without jumping out of the water. Did I scream? Yeah, it sounded like this. <laughs> so what? That's the nature of fishing, guys. Let yourself let it out when you lose a fish. You don't have to get every one of them in, but he's, he's still out there. And remember, he doesn't think that I lost him. He thinks that he lost me. So I'm sticking around and we're gonna get see if I can get that mama jama one more time out there. Because right now he thinks he lost that crayfish that he wanted really bad. It's okay to yell, guys. It's okay to cry. But when you're done and you lost the fish, you have to doff the hat. Those are the rules. The rules of fishing according to Mark. Let's go try again. Holy crap! This is another one. You can tell by looking at him, he's a full 14 inches. Two pounds, heavy. But more importantly, I caught him upstream from the riffles. Upstream, there's usually some kind of a pool and the big dogs are hunting. This is their bay blair. The big dogs get it, not the little dogs. The big dogs, they push all the little ones out or they eat them. The point is, somebody heard me, somebody's praising me. There's a bike trail right behind the trees there. Anyway. There's, they're oftentimes the big dogs are right here. This is their bay blair. And this is the prime real estate in the tail too. So the head of the riffles, the tail of the riffles is where you're gonna find, look at the markings on him. He is an absolutely gorgeous bronze back. Belly, look at the belly again, full of crayfish, all of 14 inches. And I tipped him in sideways cause I'm standing literally in ankle deep water. I was gonna beach him right here and he jumped another another one, 18 inches out of the water. That's a body length and a half out of the water, guys. And they're only in, what are they in, six inches of water? What an extraordinary feat. Wow. All right, time to put him back in. Damn. I just put the phone down and he literally tore his way right out of my grip. Even though I got him bent over. You see with my hand, I'm trying to support him a little bit. You don't want to break his jaw. I'm supporting him and he still jumped and he shredded my thumb. Damn!
Let me tell you about this guy. He's all of 10 inches. And I caught him out there in midstream where he had no business being because he's going to get eaten by one of the big dogs. But he jumped three times. Three times his whole body length. Look at the gorgeous colors on him. Light green. God, I love smallmouth. Pound for pound, inch for inch. Best, best fish. Best fighting fish you could ever hope to catch. And this river, the Fox River, here in Kane County, Illinois, is chock full of them. God, what a day. I can't, uh, my back hurts, my neck hurts, my arm hurts, and I can't stop fishing. I'm supposed to go to a graduation in a few hours, and I can't stop fishing. Ah! And then you get surprised once in a while. This guy fought like a bass. But it turned out he's it's got to be some kind of a sucker, some kind of a carp. I got to go look him up. I don't recognize him at all. He's all the wrong colors. He's some kind of blue. He's almost like a sheephead. I mean, a juvenile carp, maybe? I've never caught one this small. But his scales are all too small. He's got these beautiful blue markings on the top of his head. And he actually bit this hook. He, maybe he's that kind that they talk about in Wyoming that goes after the crayfish. Because this guy, this guy hit it and he's so thin when he turned sideways, he fought, he fought like a bass, but he didn't jump, so he had me kind of confused. Anyway, he's really pretty. He does have the double dorsal fin like most carp do. You see that rear one and then the front one? But I don't see a big tail, I don't see a big spike or anything. Let's put him in, let him go, go find out what he is. Okay, all reeled in. It's about 6.30, getting towards 7 p.m. I'm supposed to speak at a graduation for my uh, a goddaughter. So I got to get out. Otherwise, I'd keep fishing. I think we started off talking about carp. We totally struck out on the carp thing, except for one I accidentally got. I started off down there. Then I made one accidental cast cross stream, and all of a sudden, kabam! bass were in the river biting in the middle of the afternoon that was like 3 p.m that was three and a half hours ago and all I did was move up the stream casting in towards shore for the smaller ones out in the middle towards the bigger ones worked my way up to these riffles what's that it couldn't have been 200 yards that I walked upstream and you guys watched me pull out one then two then three then I hooked four, five, six, but couldn't bring him in. Then number five was a big dog, the bronze back that I showed you guys, or thereabouts. Then there was a six, a seven here. Number eight I lost, but then I went over here and I hooked a really nice bronze back that I thought might have been the one from over here, but there's no way he could have swum up here. It was a different one, but he was another 15 incher right in here, big bronze tiger. And then I finally ended the day catching some kind of little blue, odd little carp that actually bit on a crayfish. What's that, nine? Nine actually in my hand? I don't know if I took pictures. I don't know if I recorded all of them, but I took pictures. I put them out on Facebook. But a couple, couple I lost. What a great day. What a great bunch of stories. And this river, this part of the river, if this is where all the bass are hiding and they're not telling anybody, this is where Mark's going to live for the next week. That's the I-88 bridge right there running to the west and to the east going into Chicago. That's the Fox River up north. That's north That's North Aurora. And this is the Fox River heading south, hitting Sullivan Road Bridge, which is the southern boundary of North Aurora. On the other side of that begins Aurora, Illinois. And I mean, it's gotta be, it's 200 yards by a half a mile and it's all mine. Nobody was fishing here the whole day. And it's chock full of fish. So if anybody's out there and you want to join me, I'm going to be out here most evenings starting around 4 p.m. Play a little tennis, get done, or if it's too hot for tennis, jump right in and start fishing. Because when there's this many fish in here, guys, it's irresistible. All right, this really is Mark Vote with Voteland Outdoors. If you enjoy living vicariously through me, 
you just enjoy the idea of learning how to fly fish for river smallmouth and how to be successful at it. Uh, I got to try to find a rig that can that I can carry like the camera this far away from you, swing it out of the way. Nobody's invented that kind of a rig yet. So you can talk and swing. Maybe I'm going to have to make something out of PVC. That's it. Feel free to subscribe to my channel. We'll see you out there. Cut. Here's the bike trail. North to North Aurora. South down to Aurora. <laughs>